Time to take a look at the famous Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251, Special Purpose Vehicle 251, which was the most produced German armored half-track in World War II. This vehicle was mainly used within the Panzer and Panzergrenadier divisions. But it is important to point out that there were only a limited number of these available. As such, Panzergrenadiere, infantry that was trained to fight with the Panzer, were not necessarily equipped with those half tracks, and many were transported in regular trucks. This is also reflected by the existence of armor regulations for the Panzergrenadiere, where one version contains gepanzert, meaning armored in the title, while the other does not. And speaking of Panzer, if you speak German, you might take a look at this Panzer conference in September 2020 with Dr. Roman Töppel and the director of the Panzer Museum Munster, Ralf Raths. Check out the link for more information. Anyway, back to the half-track. Sadly, the exact origins of this vehicle are mostly unknown, as noted by Jens and Hilary Doyle. After searching for over 35 years in archives and museums around the world, we haven't found the conceptual design package written by the designers. Therefore, the development history has been lost. Related to this is the question how this vehicle should be employed. This might seem an odd question nowadays, but remember in World War II, Tank Infantry Corporation was in its infancy. Although I have primary sources for the late war role, the pre-war and early war situation is a bit more obscure. Likely related to this are the various functional names for the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251. In some cases, these were subvariants, yet not all of them. One of the first names was Mannschaftstransportwagen. Medium personal carrier in 1939. Yet fast forward to August 1942, the armor regulation gives the name with Mittlerer Schützenpanzerwagen, Medium Rifleman Armored Vehicle. Other manuals, notably those that are for Panzergrenadiere, usually don't give a designation and use the generic name Panzergrenadierwagen, Panzergrenadier Vehicle or Car. It could be that the initial title of personal carrier was a cover name. I don't consider this the case, although a first look seems to counter that, since the first models were equipped with two mounts for machine guns. But if we look closer, we notice that these were mainly anti-aircraft mounts and were not equipped with a gun shield for the forward firing machine gun. And additionally, originally the Panzergrenadiere should fight dismounted. Only in around 1942, mounted combat had become regular according to regulation. So from the configuration and early doctrine, it has many features of a transport vehicle. Furthermore, a document I found in the archives from January 1945 states the following. Looking back, the following can be stated. In the course of the war, the astonishing successes of the units equipped with the armored infantry fighting vehicles, the SPW battalions and the armored recon battalions, proved that the armored towing vehicle is less an armored personal carrier, but rather actually used as an armored fighting vehicle, a light but high quality combat vehicle. The problem is we can't be 100% sure here, since whoever wrote this might also be wrong about the initial employment and doctrine, although it is a bit less likely than with a post-war source. As such, this vehicle might originally have been intended to be mostly a mere transport, something that changed clearly throughout the war. This might also be related to the fact that these vehicles were rather rare. Yeah, you might have seen this vehicle quite often in documentaries. The problem is that documentaries have a tendency to use their wartime footage rather uncritically. This is rather problematic since most of it is propaganda footage, something Bismarck and I discussed lately in more detail in this video. Yet the matter of fact is, these vehicles were rare even compared to tanks. For this, it is time to take a short look at some numbers. The Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 series production started rather late, ordered in 1938, the first ones were delivered in June 1939. So just a few months before the attack on Poland. According to production statistics from 1939 to 1942, a total of 2,508 were produced, and of those around 300 had thin steel sheets instead of regular armor plates. To put this in contrast to tank production, in the same time frame, Germany had produced more than 10,000 Panzers. Although if you also account for the Panzer production before 1939, we had around 13,000 Panzer. So just from production numbers, the ratio was 1 to 4 to 1 to 5, depending on the time frame. 
as such, the Germans by numbers alone had far more experience with Panzer than with half tracks. Now, if we consider that troop trials with these half tracks began in 1939, whereas the first Panzer divisions were established in 1935, you see there's quite a doctrine gap as well. Anyway, let us move to the vehicle itself. There were basically four models of the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251, namely Ausführung A to D, which should not be confused with variants, of which were far more. These were denoted by the slash and the number and had special roles like mortar, engineer and other vehicles. Yet they are something for a future video. The first model was the Ausführung A. Only important detail is that it had two mounts for machine guns in the front and back, but initially had no gun shield in the front. Ausführung B had some minor changes, but an overall was very similar. The difference between Ausführung A and Ausführung B is the lack of C-Einsätze, vision slits, on the side of the Ausführung B. Note the gun shields for these models were retrofitted in fall 1940. Similarly, in 1940, Ausführung C went into production. It incorporated the various combat experience garnered. The Ausführung C featured a single plate nose armor and armored cars to cover the engine side intakes, and an armored shield for the four machine gun was introduced. Additionally, the bumper bar in the front was removed as well. In 1943, production was switched to the final mass produced model, the Ausführung D. This model is most easily to identify since it has a reverse slope armor plate, whereas previous models had a triangular look, as you can see here. This was not for cosmetic reasons. The armored body, vision slits and other elements were simplified to allow for a more efficient mass production. Nowadays, most half tracks that look like the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 are often OT-810s. The OT-810 was a post-war production by Czechoslovakia, since during the war the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 were produced by the Skoda Works in Plessen. It is important to mention that some people refer to the German half tracks as Hanomag. This is wrong, as pointed out by Jens and Doyle. P.S. No evidence has been found in primary sources that these armored troop carriers were ever referred to by the name Hanomag, not even as a nickname by the troops. If the Hanomag had been mentioned during the war to these troops, they would have thought that you were referring to the heavy trucks or buses for which this company was famous. Since we got that out of the way, let us look at the armor protection and technical data before we discuss the late war role. Note, the following values are for the Ausführung D. The frontal armor had a thickness of 14.5 mm. The hull sides and back had 8 mm, whereas the belly and top plates had 5.5 mm. These main pieces are constructed from bulletproof armor plates that are welded or riveted together at angles, which make it proof against attack by SMK, Spitzgeschoss mit Kern, steel core armor piercing rounds fired from 7.92 mm caliber rifles or machine guns, from positions on the ground at a range of 30 meters. Also, as you can see here, the armor plates were sloped as well, thus increasing the effective armor if hit in a straight angle. Next is some technical data and measurements. Note this information is taken from the manual for the base variant from May 1943 for the Ausführung D. The length is 5,800 millimeters, the width 2,000 millimeters, the height 2,100 millimeters, the turning circle is given with 11,000 mm, the ground clearance of the front axle with 320 mm, the fording depth is 500 mm. Now let us look at the weight and the Panzer Grenadier squad next. The empty weight is 7,000 kg. The total allowed weight is 8,500 kg. As such, you have a payload of 1,500 kg. Yet, that is not all, since an additional 2,700 could be towed. As mentioned, there were various variants, yet the most common one was the 251-1 for carrying a full Panzergrenadier squad, which consisted of 12 men, unlike the regular German infantry squad, which had 10 men with one machine gun and one submachine gun. To get the full picture, a quote from the army regulation for the Panzergrenadier company Armored from 1943. Panzergrenadier squad consists of squad leader, deputy squad leader, two machine gun riflemen number one, the gunners, two machine gun riflemen number two, the assistant gunners, four riflemen, driver for the towing vehicle, co-driver, also radio operator, three light machine guns, including one vehicle mounted machine gun, two submachine guns, including one onboard submachine gun. 
one medium armored infantry fighting vehicle. Note, original 251-1 had no radio set installed, yet in 1942 one was added and installed in front of the co-driver. So let's move to the performance data. The horsepower is given at 100 when at 2800 revolutions per minute. As such, we have a horsepower to weight ratio of 11.7 at maximum weight. In contrast, the Panzer III Ausführung H had around 14.0 and the T-34 Model 41 had 17.9. As such, the half deck was less powerful and it also had an unpowered front axle which is in contrast to the US half track M3, thus very likely preferring worse cross-country than these tanks. The Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 had a total of 111 track links, which is an odd number, which is odd, since the vehicle had two tracks. Well, the number of track links was different for each side. The left side had 55 and the right side 56 links. Similarly, the left track was shorter with a total length of 7,700 mm, whereas the right had 7,840 mm. The fuel tank could hold 160 liters. Sadly, the manual gives no information on the range, although one good source notes that the range on the rope was about 300 km and 150 km for cross country movement. But back to the manual. When it comes to speed, the manual gets extremely detailed. The speed is given for each gear and various ratios. I spare the detail, the speed for each gear on roads was, as you can see here, so we have a top speed of 52.5 km per hour and the off-road values are as follows. As you can see here, the top speed is given with 21.2 km per hour. For contrast here, the off-road values for some Panzers. Although a late war German training plan for it states that the half track was more limited than the Panzers in regard to cross country movement. Anyway, let us move to the probably most interesting technical aspect of the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251, namely its steering. Quote from a regulation The steering of the vehicle is done number one by turning the front wheels and two by giving the two tracks different speeds with the help of the steering gear. The two steering modes are connected in such a way that the brakes of the steering gear only start to work when the front wheels have a greater angle. When the steering wheel is turned slightly, the steering gear only acts as a differential gear. Sadly, the document does not give the degree or I missed it. I found a value in a secondary source or the one I found a few errors in. As such, I'm not sure if the following value is correct. It is noted that past 15 degrees the clutch and brake steering mechanism kicks in. Now what is quite interesting is how the German army portrayed the half-track in late war to the regular infantry. In September 1944 it released a training pamphlet about what the infantrymen should know about armored vehicles. And it notes, the armored personnel carrier is not there to support you but to protect the armored grenadier and make him mobile, because the armored grenadier must be able to follow the tank attack. It is his task to exploit the success of the tank attack like a flash and to secure it immediately. Even the tank cannot fight without grenadiers, but to make sure that the grenadiers can follow its speed, its thrust, there is the SPW. The special vehicles, cannon half-track, mortar half-track, flamethrower half-track also have no other task to protect infantry weapons and their operation and make them mobile. The training pamphlet continues with an interesting analogy. It asks what is the purpose of a foxhole. The answer is also provided. Namely that it protects against small arms fire and shrapnel, yet that it does not protect against a direct hit nor against attacks from the air. Then it asks what is the purpose of a vehicle and the answer is it provides mobility, conserves energy of the squad and allows to reach a destination quickly. Yet it is also a big target and many men are located in a rather small space. As such it is concluded that the Schützenpanzerwagen is both a foxhole and a vehicle. The armored personnel carrier is both a foxhole and a vehicle, a mobile foxhole. So it protects against infantry bullets and shrapnel and against many mines, but it does not protect against direct hits, especially against anti-tank gun hits. It does not protect against danger from above, especially attack aircraft, so it brings the firepower of the squad quickly to the enemy. But it is a big and quite high target. A whole squad is crowded together in its belly. It drives fast on roads, but off-road it can't drive wherever the tank can get through. 
To conclude, the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 was likely introduced as a transport vehicle for the infantry accompanying the Panzers, and over the course of the war it switched into a combat role. We know that initially the Panzer Grenadiers should fight dismounted, whereas around 1942 this changed to mounted combat. In late war, the Germans for educational purposes called it a moving foxhole, since it provided protection against small arms fire and shrapnel, while also being highly mobile. Although after 1943 more than 10,000 were built, before 1943 the number were a mere 2,500, which was just a fraction of the Panzers produced in that same time frame. Due to this and its late introduction in 1939, the development of doctrine and tactics for the Haftrecht was less pronounced than those of the Panzers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, consider supporting my channel via Patreon or Subscribestar. This allows me to go to trips to museums, events and of course the archives. Big thank you here to the Panzer Museum Munster for inviting me to start off the Heide 2019. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.